So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much again for taking the time to join us for the second session of the Clean Air Advocacy Training. Um, I just wanted to reintroduce myself. My name is Deja Williams, and I am the Environmental Justice Manager for Clean Air NC. Um, today's session, we will cover a general overview of the permitting and zoning process in Mecklenburg County. Um, and within that topic, we'll also go over a couple tools that you can use to determine the location of polluting sources near you um, and some resources to increase engagement in the air permitting and zoning uh, processes and decisions. Um, and in tying all of this together, we will also learn um, a little bit about how community about community benefits agreements and how they can be used to um, negotiate reductions in air pollution with uh, local polluting entities. So again, um, before getting started, I just wanted to quickly go over some housekeeping. Um, so this training will also be recorded and be available and sent via email along with all of the uh, presentations and relevant resources and contact information of the speakers. Um, again, I encourage you to share both of the recorded sessions with your neighbors. Um, I wanted to remind everyone as well that uh, for joining these sessions, you will receive a uh, stipend. And Ron and I were going to plan to distribute those stipends within the community on August 2nd. And we can talk a little bit more about that at the end of the session because we're flexible if that date doesn't work for you. But uh, we will be distributing the stipends as well as the resource packet. And for those that um, indicated in the survey that you wanted to receive a purple air monitor, we'll, we can also do installations on that day as well. But again, we're flexible. Um, so just let us know. And then uh, lastly, like last time, we're gonna take a break in between uh, each presenter to allow for questions. Um, however, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat um, or raise your hand and, and our team will, will cue those questions. And I know we had a few people that called in. So if anyone is calling in, I just wanted to remind you that you can press star nine to raise and lower your hand and then star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I just wanted to introduce our agenda and welcome uh, all of our speakers. So joining us again is Megan Green from Mecklenburg County Air Quality. Um, this time, Megan will be covering the regulatory air permitting process in Mecklenburg County, as well as uh, some of those tools that I mentioned to locate permitting facilities, or permitted facilities, excuse me. <clears throat> and then we are also joined today by Alicia Osborne and Gretchen Flores from the city of Charlotte. Um, Alicia is the Assistant Director for the Charlotte Future uh, 2040 Comprehensive Plan, as well as the Director of Historic West End for Charlotte City Partners. And uh, Gretchen works for the City of Charlotte's Planning, Design, and Development Department um, in the Long Range and Strategic Planning Division. Um, I also wanted to introduce, well, introduce Jennifer DeRue um, and her partners. Uh, at, sorry. Pretty good. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Um, and then I also wanted to introduce uh, Jennifer DeRue and her partners at Dream Key Partners. Um, through mm -hmm. programs and partnerships with the City of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, Social Serve, and others, they work to bring okay. people together um, in the pursuit of solving the affordable housing crisis. And then we also have Eric uh, Zavarill from Sustain Charlotte. Um, for those that are not familiar with the organization, it's a nonprofit organization helping to advance local sustainability here in Charlotte through smart growth. Um, and collectively, Alicia, Gretchen, Jennifer, and Eric will speak to the opportunities that live within the UDO for a healthy environment, as well as, um, again, how to get more involved within uh, zoning decisions. And then finally, we're joined by uh, Ishmael Kwe'im, and I apologize if I pronounced that wrong, um, but he is the principal attorney at Queen City Law Firm, um, and his commitment to providing high quality legal services to Charlotte's underserved population stems from his own experiences growing up in West Charlotte. Um, today, he's going to be speaking about community benefits agreements, specifically what it is, how it works, and its potential to be used on industries to limit emissions and track progress over time. So uh, just, we have a lot of topics to cover today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Megan. Thank you so much. And while I'm getting my screen, um, while I'm getting the presentation pulled up, it gives me an opportunity to recognize that I'm joined here by two of my colleagues, um, Jason Rayfield, who's our Permanent and Enforcement Program Manager, 
and also Leslie Rose, who's our air quality director. So I'm glad to have them on the line with us today. Um, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of, um, of, of permitting here in Mecklenburg County. And um, then I think I'm gonna really spend a lot of the time walking you through one of our tools, our online air pollution facility database. Um, so um, those of you who were on the, the call uh, at the last meeting, you saw me um, put this slide up here that just kind of talks about the mission of our agency, which is to basically be a resource for improving air quality here within Mecklenburg County. And um, with our goal being to meet and um, maintain compliance with those health-based standards, those national health-based standards. And we have the three program areas. I talked a lot about monitoring last time. And today we're gonna dig into our permit and enforcement group a little bit more. Um, we do also have a mobile sources group, which um, deals with mobile or kind of the, the trap, like, um, mobile sources of air pollution, like on-road vehicles and non-road equipment. Um, but we will have to talk more about that at a later, a later time. So permitting in Mecklenburg County. Uh, within Mecklenburg County, we, um, there are over 500 facilities that are required to obtain a permit from our agency, Mecklenburg County Air Quality. Sometimes they'll refer, hear me refer to it as MACAC, that's just our acronym. Um, so they're required to obtain a permit from us before they're allowed to either construct a new facility or operate a facility within Mecklenburg County. And um, a unique thing about Mecklenburg County is that we actually have a lower threshold for which facilities and types of businesses are required to obtain that permit to operate from us. And in fact, most of the facilities that are required to have a permit here within Mecklenburg County, um, if they were located in other parts of the state, they would not be required to receive a, a permit to operate. So what that means is that we have like additional oversight over these businesses that, um, which we think is a, a benefit and leads to increased compliance um, and lower air pollution here locally. I've got one example pictured here of a type of um, a piece of equipment that in other parts of the state, it's it, these are operated, but they're not necessarily tracked by the state through their official permitting process. Um, this is an example of a portable crusher. So it's a crusher, it can crush rock, that sort of thing. And it can be moved from different areas um, to do different jobs. Within Mecklenburg County, this type of portable crusher is required to receive a permit to operate. And so we know kind of where it's gonna be, when it's gonna be um, moved, where it's gonna be operated. And there's a whole um, a permit document that outlines all of the requirements related to that particular piece of equipment um, that exists here within Mecklenburg County um, as a result of our, our lower permitting thresholds. So um, our staff really works to minimize pollution from industrial facilities, and we have a variety of tools to do that, um, various surveillance tools. So the, the primary tool that you've heard me talk about is a, is a permit to operate. Um, and that's a tool where we combine, we actually, anytime a new facility comes into the, to the county or is um, trying to expand a facility, they're required to come to us and we actually review an application. So they must submit an application. We review the application and we basically compile all of the applicable rules to that type of operation into a document that outlines um, reporting requirements, emission standards, all of the things that are relevant to those pieces of equipment and that type of operation into one um, permit, a, what we think is like a tool for compliance because it has all of the requirements in one place for facility. And that becomes the basis of, of our kind of permitting and enforcement program. We also do routine surveillance inspections. Um, these are unannounced inspections where we go out and check and make sure that facilities are complying with the requirements of their permit. Um, you've got a, a picture here of one of our colleagues out doing a compliance inspection at a gas station. Um, the good news about our compliance inspections is that when we do these compliance inspections, um, at least in 2021, 93% of inspections resulted in a finding of compliance with all applicable rules and requirements. We also um, have monitoring and record keeping requirements, um, sometimes testing, and then we also do compliance assistance routinely with facilities. Again, making sure that they have all the information they need to um, operate in compliance with the rules here locally. We're actually gonna go through a permit um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so you'll get to see kind of a real life like example of a facility 
um, a facility permit that here locally at the end of my presentation. Um, and actually, the, that's kind of the, the cool, really cool thing about um, this tool that I'm about to show you is that it does allow you to actually go in and see um, documents related to facilities. Um, so it, this is our, um, our facility database and it's online and accessible to the public. And so one of the um, interesting things about this facility database is that it allows you to see um, activity reports related to facilities. So things that we're doing at facilities, it allows you to see emissions from facilities and to review facility permits. Um, and so I'm actually gonna stop sharing this screen so I can switch over and share my web browser so that we can actually walk through together this tool. Okay, so um, after I finish my presentation, I'll drop the link to this tool in the um, chat for you, as well as my contact information so you have that. So when you pull up the tool, typically this is the first thing you're gonna see. And so it's a map that allows you to then search an address. So in this case, I took the um, uh, Allegra, Allegra Westbrook Library and put that address in here. So it allows you to then search. And so you've got a little radius here. If I wanted to expand the radius, I can just go to this drop down menu. You can go up to a mile and you can search this mile. So the little, um, the little uh, I guess, icons that you see here, uh, there's a corresponding legend up at the top. And so the, I don't see any red um, pins on this, on this view, but red pins are for permitted facilities. These are facilities that are required to have that operating permit. Um, we also have permitted gas stations. It's a smaller subset of the permitted facilities, um, but because they are so numerous in the county, we've just made them a different color here. And then we have registered facilities. Registered facilities are facilities that they're essentially on our radar, but um, because of the um, potential emissions from the facility, they're actually below permitting thresholds. So they're not uh, required to get a permit to operate um, it from us, but they are again on our radar. We've reviewed their operations to make sure that, they're, um, that there isn't a requirement to get a permit. So if I click on one of these icons, I can go straight to the facility site in the database. And so within this, I can see things like their compliance status. And so for this facility, um, they are in compliance by inspection, which means that the that we did an inspection out there that resulted in, in fact, they were last inspected in March and they were in compliance with that March 2022 inspection. Um, I also see here that they, performed a stack test. So a stack test is a type of test that's done where they are actually measuring to make sure that you're meeting emission standards so that you're not, um, so that you're, they're confirming that you're not producing excess emissions. And so there was a stack test at this facility, at this gas station on, um, on in April, 2021. Um, I can also go and um, look for action items, so it tell, this will give you a list of all of our activities at a specific facility. And if you can, if you were to click on these individually, you could go in and read kind of the narrative about what was done within the activity report. I can see if there's been an NOV. So it looks like in this case, there were um, the, one of their caps on their tank was not sealing properly, and so you can see that it was resolved. These are all from, I guess, looks like 20, 2003, so not recent, no recent NOVs. But you can see that there's a pretty good history that you can look at here. And then the last thing where I really wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive and kind of pull this up so you had it for reference was to show you that you can access permits, the actual permit we write for each facility here within Mecklenburg County. And so I click on this document, it opens up a PDF. And so we're just gonna walk through, because each of the permits has kind of a standard. It's got usually the same components, um, but it's just customized to the type of operation. So in this case, we've got basic information about the facility here. And then we have something called an emission source table. And it's gonna list each of the different types of emission sources that we know about at a facility. Um, and in, in this case, and in most cases, there's a control device 
that is listed on here. And in this case, it's just a vapor tight seal and um, a certain amount of maintaining pressure within the, the gasoline storage tanks. Um, and then, so there's an emission source table for each facility. Then we have conditions and, and you first start with like administrative or general conditions. Um, these do things like um, talk about uh, the issuance of, of, um, of the permit, if there's a permit that needs to be voided because of this new permit being issued, that would be listed here. We then have operational requirements that are listed in our um, permits at the beginning. And again, these, these apply to pretty much every facility within Mecklenburg County. So it speaks to things like dust, odor, record keeping, all of these things are here at the beginning of a permit. And, and again, apply to facilities across the county. Then we have a section called specific conditions and limitations. And so these are, again, they're specific to the actual facility that the permit was written for. So remember I said we go through all the rules when we get an application and we pull out the ones that are specific to the facility and put them in the document. This is where we've pulled together all of those rules that apply to an operation. So in this case, we've got the rules that are listed out here for this facility. And then we've got a monitoring requirement. So these are things that they are required to check for and monitor. In this case, it's some of their emission controls. They're required to monitor on a monthly basis to make sure their emission controls are working. That performance test requirement, we saw the performance test date in their original site record, but this just gives you more details about what the, the testing requirement is for that facility. And then we have notification and reporting requirements. And so this would be things like, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I guess someone knocked on my door and I don't even need a door bell because I have a, um, my dog. So apologies for the, the brief interruption here. Um, no one is gonna sneak up on me, that's for sure. All right, let me pause for just one minute. Okay, um, let's get through this permit. So the, um, we also have reports. These are reports that a facility would be required to submit to us. And at a minimum, facilities within Mecklenburg County are required to submit an annual emissions report, um, which again, allows us to calculate specifically how much air pollution was generated from facilities. And then we can confirm that they are below all applicable thresholds for their facility. Um, and then at the very end, we have um, a, a, a appendices. Um, and so in this, this would be a place where we could um, identify uh, p things that are, are, that we've reviewed. So equipment, or in this case, these are storage tanks that we've reviewed and determined that they don't have applicable requirements within our ordinance. Um, and so in this case, it's like a storage tank for kerosene. Um, that is, doesn't have an applicable requirement for it. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions about the information I have covered so far. And I will also stop scrolling because I don't wanna cause anyone to get seasick. I'm, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can go back to gallery view. Um, but if I need to pull something back up, I'm happy to. Does anyone have any questions for Megan? Um, hi, uh, hi, Megan. Um, I just, uh, I just had one question about the specific conditions that you mentioned. Um, so, how are how are those usually determined in reference to a particular site? And in that case, is that is there room for I guess uh, community concerns to really maybe shape what some of those might look like? So all of the specific conditions originate from our Mecklenburg County Air Pollution Control Ordinance. Um, and so, they, so essentially we get an application where we go in and we review like the types of equipment, the amount of um, usage for the, that equipment, and that leads us to different applicable rules. They're compiled into those specific conditions. Um, I, what I think, I think the Actually, I'm excited to hear the presentation that you're going to give a little bit later because I feel like where we've seen a lot of success is kind of working outside of the 
permitting process to address community concerns. Um, I know, for example, that Ron has raised with me concerns about dust coming from a facility within the community and actually having direct conversation with them about that issue. Um, he, he, I think at the last meeting, you shared that they were gonna be installing like a wheel wash as a result of your, of your um, conversations with them. And so it was one of those things where, um, you know, we didn't necessarily have a tool in our ordinance that, could have that would have required them to, to install a wheel wash, but the conversation, the ongoing conversation between a community member and an industrial facility um, resulted in, at least it sounds like it could result in a resolution that addressed a community concern. I think where we can, like be that, we can be that bridge and that connector um, where if there is a specific facility that maybe you're, you don't know where to start with that facility, we can help build that connection and be that bridge. Yes, Megan, this is Ron. I have a, a question. Um, are there any different thresholds at, uh, based upon where a facility could be located? Again, in, in you know, historic Weston, we have a lot, and some of the parts of Charlotte as well, have a lot of uh, industrial type facilities in close proximity to the uh, residences. So is there, are there different thresholds that uh, you, you look at versus, um, uh, you know, a, a industrial facility or commercial facility that's not in close proximity to, um, you know, a residential, residential uh, neighborhoods? So zoning is a part of our permitting process. So in other words, if, if a new facility is locating to the area or if there's a facility that's like expanding their footprint, we do require um, a zoning, um, it's not an applicability, it's a, um, a zoning consistency determination from the city of Charlotte. So in other words, um, that the land use allows for this type of operation at the parcel, like the, the specific place where the facility is gonna be operating. Um, very big picture, there are limits about like in areas, like non-attainment areas or maintenance areas, there are limits on very big facilities, like facilities with very large emissions, being able to move to a facility, I mean, being able to move to like an area um, but that's typically at a county level geography, not a neighborhood scale geography. Um, and to be honest, we don't really see th that kind of size facility looking to, to move here to Mecklenburg County. Um, I guess our history has been that the bigger facilities are they're actually leaving the county. Um, I think, Jason, maybe you know the specifics, but I know we've had... Um, so the biggest category of facility is a, uh, it's called a Title V facility. It's um, a big enough facility that if, if we did not have a local program, EPA would still permit these facilities here locally. Um, we see, have seen the number of Title V facilities in the county decrease over time. Um, and it's really that size and scale of facility that would um, potentially have a threshold where they they it would might might limit where they could come into a county but again it's a county level analysis and not usually a neighborhood level analysis megan could you speak a little more to the notification process and and how folks can where they can go or you know sign up on what yeah. steps? Nowhere. Definitely. I'm going to drop a link in the chat. So I'm, I know I'm going to put three things in there. My contact information, I'm going to send, put a link to that map, the um, database tool, and I'm going to put a link to where you can sign up to receive notifications about public comment opportunities. So anytime a facility, either a new facility is coming into the county, or if a facility is making a change that will increase emissions, we require in Mecklenburg County, we require them to go through a 15 day public comment process. And we have an email listserv that's been set up. You can actually sign up to get those emails. So you'll be notified when there's a public comment opportunity um, for permits, 
There are occasionally other public comment opportunities that are not related to permits, but you'll basically be in the loop about our Air Quality Commission meetings and public comment opportunity meetings by signing up for that specific listserv. Thanks, Megan. Um, any other questions for Megan? Um, <clears throat> Megan, this is June with Clean Air NC. Thanks for that presentation. Um, so I'm on the website that you were on and I pulled up a facility. And so um, the milestones is a nice, you know, summary of the kinds of reports, emissions reports that the company has submitted. Um, and um, then the NOV is notice of violations. That's another one community members may want to take a look at. Um, and I, I guess I was I was wondering on the um, on the milestones, it'll have toxic um, air pollutants or hazardous air pollutants inventory, emission inventory. There's no links to those. Are there any links on this website to um, national air toxics? assessment or things like that. Yeah. So June, if you go over, there's an emissions tab. Yep. And that is going to list all historic emissions for each facility. And so yes. So the emissions all, emissions points or emissions let me, limits. It is called um emission I'm sorry. I so the way it's pulled up, Jason, do you know the answer to that? I am on the permit tab and I can't get back. So, yeah, I believe it's uh, labeled as emissions or mission, uh, which should show a, a facility wide, you know, summary of the, the pollutant emissions. But yeah, Jim, yeah. to answer your question, yeah. that would be the place to go look for those emissions. That milestone tab is really what my folks are using to check compliance. And we enter those milestones and run reports on those milestones to make sure we get the timely re reports. Mm -hmm. And we, we input that data into the database and you can see that with that emissions tab. Okay. Yeah, on the emission limits, there's all kinds of air pollutants listed. I mean, some of them, there aren't any actuals. Um, and then the emissions points are much, yeah, that's a, that doesn't list pollutants. That's something else, so. Okay, I'll, I'll play and, with it some and more. So, I've realized that we have spent, you know, maybe 15 minutes talking about air permitting. You know, there are folks that, you know, our, our standard training for a new employee is six months. And so I will just say, please, if you, if you are on our website and having questions about a facility, please, you know, reach out to me. I'm happy, me, Jason, we can get you together with the person who wrote the permit. We can um, answer your questions if you are not sure what you're looking at or you have questions about a permit. Great. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I think that is a, a good segue into our uh, second set of speakers. Um, so Alicia, I, I believe you're gonna start us off, um, but I'll, I'll hand it over to Alicia, Gretchen, Jennifer, and Eric. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Osborne with the City of Charlotte Planning Department, and I do not still work at Center City Departments. I know I saw Rona Ross just laughing because he knows that I don't work there anymore. <laughs> it's been about four or five years, but it's okay. Um, it's okay, Deja. It's all right. Um, but I, I briefly want to talk about kind of the Unified Development Ordinance, which is um, a set of, of of kind of an implementation tools for the Charlotte Future 2040 comprehensive plan. And I didn't prepare a presentation. Um, many of you have already seen it. I'll just give the highlights of what the document is, a little bit about the process and how people, the next steps and how um, you can stay involved. Um, and so the Unified Development Ordinance is a set of tools um, primary, primarily to implement the Charlotte Future 2040 plan, um, the, the policies for growth and development set out within that plan. And so it essentially takes about eight ordinances that, that are a set of rules about how we grow and develop 
and combines them into one document. So people may say, oh my God, this document is 600 or so pages. Just imagine being a resident or developer or anyone trying to do business in Charlotte, sifting through eight to 10 different documents that were over 1,200 or so pages altogether. So what this document essentially seeks to do is two things. One, um, provide a set of rules that implement the comp plan and also to consolidate a, a suite of regulatory rules that have been kind of all over the place that makes it easier for people to understand how uh, we want to grow and develop over, over time. And so that process essentially started long, 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 long time ago. And the way that, when I say a long, long time ago, it literally started about 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, Eric's laughing to keep from crying because he's been on that stakeholder group for about that long. And it really has been quite a journey to get to where we are today. And um, the way that the process was developed, it was in um, kind of segments. They started and tested a couple of um, groups of zoning districts to see what's the best way to implement um, or to create a new set of rules. And so that process started in 2015 or so before the comp plan. Um, we got a new planning director. He said, pause, we need a vision first before we um, design the rules and, and set the vision. So the UDO was paused and then we completed the comp plan. But what the UDO has been able to do is build upon the engagement and the ideas within the comprehensive plan to put forth in the document that is currently under review um, today. And so that's a little bit of history about the process there in terms of engagement and how people were involved and how you still can be involved. Um, a citizen advisory group called the Ordinance Advisory Committee has been a sounding board for the UDO since about 2011, 2012. Um, it's been a while. Um, and that group has been able to keep staff honest and on their toes about what makes sense, doesn't make sense. And that group is com comprised of developers, neighborhood representatives, um, and some other um, kind of non-government partners throughout the city. And so it was a mixture of different people that were um, able to provide their feedback throughout that process. And so what they continue to do, and as there's been um, three different drafts of the document, um, there have been um, a number of different engagement opportunities at each phase of the document. And so uh, the public's been able to review it, provide comments, um, call staff, email, show up at meetings, um, and trying to help us to get it right. But what we want people to understand is that this is by no means the end all and be all for the document. These types of things evolve over time. So as you as we learn more and, and understand what we didn't get right or what we got right, there's a process, um, openly, open and public process for modifying and making changes to it. And so um, by no means think that if you haven't heard of it by today, that you won't be able to be involved in the future. And so the next steps for the, the Unified Development Ordinance, again, it's been out for public review since <clears throat> early spring and um, council, the planning commission recommended to approve the document last Tuesday. Um, council will have um, their opportunity and they've been reviewing it and having a dialogue around it too, that's who makes the decision. Um, and so council, um, another adoption draft will be released for their review and for the public review on August 15th. And then council will make a, um, and that will reflect all the revisions that the communities um, um, suggested on the document. And so those will appear in the August 15th draft. And then council will make their decision on August 22nd, whether to um, consider the plan, the document for adoption. And so what it looks like moving forward in terms of being engaged in, in the process is, um, <clears throat> I would visit the, the UDO website. It's called um, charlotteudo.org. 
um, Gretchen, if you could drop that in the chat for me. Um, that's one way to stay abreast of the document and to see how it evolves over time and provide comments to staff. There's a number of links in there to send staff information to provide comments. But as development happens in the future, um, I know the team is exploring, definitely the, the land development team is exploring ways to have more community um, uh, meetings or engagement around uh, products, uh, projects in the future. So um, they're currently working on that and will roll something out once the UDO is adopted, but they're looking at ways to be, to provide more engagement opportunities for development projects in the future. And so, um, again, as I mentioned, by no means is this the last time that, to get engaged, but definitely um, visit the website to stay abreast of what's happening with the project over the next couple of weeks. And I'll pause if you have any questions um, about the process or, or about the document itself. And Alicia, this is Eric. I just realized that I have all your visuals too uh, that I could have had up, but I didn't want to interrupt you in your process. <laughs> So I oh, you have all later. of the slides and all that good stuff? Just, the, just about of everything you just talked about. <laughs> hey, that's that's a good thing. <laughs> that means we're on the same page. <laughs> so I, I intentionally didn't want to do slides because it's it's it can get rather complicated. Um, and so I just wanted to provide the opportunity to have dialogue, honest dialogue and discussion around the topic. So... Eric, would you mind sharing that with me so I can share it as a resource, <coughs> if that's okay? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I could uh, convert it to a PDF and then uh, send it to you, and then you can get it out to everybody. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and if Gretchen or you, Eric, or Jennifer, if you guys want to add any anything else to the topic as well, please feel free. I do. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Duru Perry, and I'm with Dream Key Partners. Uh, we are an affordable housing developer. Um, I see some very familiar faces, so it's it's good to see you all. Um, and then I see some new faces, which is always good as well. But I'll I'll try to make this a little a little bit quick because we know how these evening meetings can be. But um, I think in part one, there was some conversation about how we got here and Alicia hit on a very a good point which is that it takes time so <clears throat> I just want to underline the fact that it it takes time for good things to happen and then it takes time for bad things to happen so one reason why it's really good to stay involved and stay connected whether it's through um, county boards, city boards, there's like over 35 um, options that you can choose from is because you, you're paying taxes anyway, and you really want to understand how this money is being spent. Um, you really want to understand what the echo of today's moment is going to be five years, 10 years into the future. Um, things are always changing and evolving. There's always input being given. And when you stay connected through those routes, there's a real opportunity to understand who's already at the table and what they've been working to build. So um, I just wanna to underscore that point. Um, also to not be discouraged, um, I've sat on boards and whatnot and you go in and you may be very excited and ready to see things happen right away. Um, but it, it does take time to understand who you're serving on the board with. Different boards have different functions. Some, you know, they may be a sounding board. Some may be to uh, advise on policy. It really just depends on the topic. But patience is, is definitely something to have in your back pocket. Uh, but you will see the payoff of that. Um, and I think the, the third thing I want to underscore is um, the money factor as well. I mean, the city of Charlotte just passed their fiscal budget for 2023, and it's a $3.2 billion budget. So I, I try to communicate to folks that 
there is money being spent with purpose and you already have the position and authority to to try to understand and direct what that purpose should be so i just think it's great um, to see old and new faces i am stepping in for my colleague gerard jones so he would probably do a much better job than i but um if you have any questions on that feel free to let me know i will put in the chat the links to the county and city opportunities for um for boards and then you can also always select and notify me it's a little envelope and you'll be notified of different board vacancies that way as well jennifer being extremely modest asia jennifer used to work in um economic development at the city of charlotte real estate at the city of charlotte and cats at the city of charlotte so she knows a whole lot about engagement, the development process, especially allocation of, of um, city funding to um, revitalization efforts and corridors. So don't let her fool me with the little small meek and mouth speech <laughs> that Gerard could do much better because she's <laughs> packed with knowledge as well. So Jen, yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> Please, yeah. And thank you so much for that context, Jennifer. We're we're going to be sent in the resource packet. We'll be sending out a list of boards and commissions for both the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. Um, and Jennifer will also put the chat, put the link in the chat. Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions, or um, if any? Anyone else on the call that, that works within this realm, if you would like to, to add um, to any of these points. Daisy, uh, this is Ron. I have a, 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 a question. Um, I don't know if Alicia or, or Gretchen, either one can respond. Um, you know, we're basically, we're, our premise on this, this call is we're in you know, our concern about the uh, environment pollution um, that's in our in our community specifically uh, and uh, the impact that certain types of businesses have on our within our communities so um, with the uh, implementation of the UDO uh, again I'm, I'm still not don't have complete resolve of the whole process but um, with within that context of the UDO, um, how is that Im impacting, um, you know, the, the current zoning and, and 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 regulations based on where uh, certain types of industries are, are located? I know all these different areas have been designated specific zones and so forth, manufacturing, etc. But again, our concern is, and my concern is that we already have a lot of those types of facilities that are in close proximity and have a negative impact on our on our community. So, right. how can we maneuver within within that process to improve and lessen exposure that those entities have on our on our communities? Uh, so I think I was. I knew you would ask that question, and I was thinking about um, who was just presenting. She went off screen uh, when she talked about the permitting process, and 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 the UDO is simply um, implementing the vision within the plan. And there are a lot of things that are already existing in our community. So I think looking forward, it's it's easier to put things in place as new development happens, right? Like that's that's a no-brainer. But I think the more difficult part of the discussion is writing the wrongs of the past, which I think a lot of what you're talking about, and it's the environmental justice component that's been kind of a struggle, I, I would say for Charlotte and other communities across the country are, are really trying to figure out how to measure that and to put things in place to address it. And so that's the hardest part is one, 
saying, here's where we've done poorly in terms of environmental justice. How might we create programs and policies, projects, and allocate funding to correct those wrongs? So what we have been committed to since the adoption of the comp plan is figuring out how to create, develop a series of metrics to measure exactly what you're talking about, um, the environmental justice issues that currently exist, and how do we not continue to make that? What do those metrics look like? Um, it's not just adjacency to each other, which is what a typical land use plan does is say, this next to this is bad. But if it already exists, how do you mitigate or make that condition better in the future? What actually, what can we actually do? So we have an intern, you guys may know him. He lives in, he lives in the West End, Daniel Falder. He's been working with the county, looking at how can we create an environmental justice plan similar to um, what I think one of his ideal cities or uh, kind of uh, sample cities is, is Chicago. Just being really progressive and thinking, how do we be intentional about that in Charlotte? And so he's helping us to develop some ideas. Um, of course, there'll be some engagement around all of that, and we'll we'll begin to incorporate that thinking as we do our community area plans, which is the more neighborhood-based approach to thinking about how we grow and develop over time. The comp plan was very big picture, broad, citywide. And we're going to begin a process that process that talks to neighborhoods about those same elements, and we'll be able to speak more specifically about the environmental justice components. Um, I think that's what we've been kind of communicating to you all. Anyways, Mr. Ross, I know uh, Sylvia Bill Patton has definitely been. Uh, don't she has not forgotten what we said we would do, and she makes sure that. And so we we want to make sure that when we move forward with that process, that's that's a part of our thinking. So we can be more granular in our approach because it's hard to say citywide, here's what the West Side needs when we're just looking too broadly and the conversation was bigger. But now when we start doing community area plans, we'll be able to talk more specifically about what makes sense for a particular neighborhood, what programs, policies, and then being more aggressive about what's, what's the funding that needs to make things happen. And it won't just be a citywide approach. It has to be county and regional because a lot of these environmental factors and indicators are regional in monitoring them. And so what's the cum cumulative effect of those and how might we create um, some policies that make sense from a neighborhood perspective? It's coming. And that's what I'm always saying, it's coming. <laughs> but I have forgot about it. <laughs> We won't well, let you forget about it. I know, I know. <laughs> and so and that's, need to... Gretchen's, that's Gretchen's team that's yeah. leading that implementation work. So she might be able to speak more about it too. Yeah, no, Alicia, you covered it perfectly. I just wanted to add that the last piece to that is really holding ourselves accountable. And the way to do that um, from, you know, from our perspective is to have a really um, heavy data-based approach on how we're doing on what, you know, what areas of the city need specific programs, like Alicia was saying, or um, tools. And the way that we can best do that is to um, have a data-driven approach. So we are working on a data dashboard. Um, and that we have, we probably have about 25% of the data that we need. Um, so the goal of that is really to figure out what metrics, <coughs> are, what metrics are gonna help us figure out where the needs are and uh, where we're being effective and where, where we're not being effective. Um, and that would be an, that, that'll be an ongoing process basically. So right now we have about 25% of the data. The goal is that in the next uh, four to five years is to have um, a good amount of data that we can really assess where we are um, in terms of specific goals and then be able to say, okay, this is where the, the need is this is what we need to collect next. And um, these are the, the tools and the, and the metrics that uh, will help us get there. Thank you, Gretchen. Did anyone have any other questions for our wonderful speakers? <clears throat> um, 
I, I did have a question as it pertained to the UDO. Um, what kind of issues uh, came up during the, if you can share, um, just issues that came up during the UD, UDO process from, from neighborhoods? Were there any main themes? Um, I'll share a few and I'm sure Eric, uh, who's on the ordinance advisory committee, can ha has a more comprehensive list. I know one was around um, short-term rentals. That's like Airbnbs and that type of thing and um, regulating those, uh, providing some kind of, you know, restrictions on those. Those have been removed and will be studied to um, have, you know, conversations in the future about. I know a lot of communities around the country are looking at how to control those. But what we heard in Charlotte is that that has been um, a key source of income for folks during the pandemic. Um, and so we just heard a lot of, of really strong concerns about let's do some more studying to make sure we understand what this means for us and maybe revisit the topic at a future date. Um, another thing I think were um, heights in neighborhood and residential areas, kind of um, the heights of, of residential structures. And I think you guys have gotten into a better place, Eric. Um, I, I think they're they're in a better place with it, with where they are. Um, There's yes, definitely um, some improvements. I could. Uh, uh oh, Eric's got share. A <laughs> uh, yeah, let me see. These are some of the topics that were discussed. <laughs> Um, uh, let me see. So lots of stuff centered around affordable housing, uh, of course. And uh, these are the changes that occurred in the second draft. I know there's a lot of information, but we're going to send it to you so you can take a look over these slides. Um, parking was another issue as well uh, that was raised. Um, heritage trees was another topic uh, that also gained a lot of attention. Uh, and I want to say the height transitions, uh, let's see, I have them right here. So I know some neighborhoods <coughs> weren't completely satisfied with this. Uh, it was 65 in the first draft. It is now 50. I know a lot of uh, folks would like to see 40 or 45 feet transition um, between your resident neighborhood one and your bigger, big, bigger buildings in your neighborhood two. So that's just to give you an idea, it's been a process as the theme has been all along tonight. Um, you know, starting off with a lot of things that you see here in slides, uh, the OAC, which you can see all the members here, um, a lot of the folk, couple of folks on the call today, um, along with neighborhoods, but there's also a lot of developers too. So going forward, I wanna, you know, as, you know, that, that list will go around and being engaged, staying engaged, signing up for whatever the next version of the OAC becomes as we move through the implementation process and all of the updates that will come to the UDO. Uh, please sign up because I know we have a lot of other representation and we need more of the neighbors and neighborhoods around the city as well. So uh, you, you can see some gaps of places not being represented, and we need to get more folks involved. And I know, as Alicia mentioned, the community <coughs> planning, area planning, is going to be very key uh, to some of the issues you just mentioned about the environmental and pollution. Um, you know, there could be opportunities to uh, work different changes into the UDO, like uh, the Planning Commission made a recommendation that all gas stations uh, and automobile service um, shops would go from being like conventional, meaning that they occur, to conditional, meaning that if somebody wants to build a new gas station, they and it's zoned for it, they can't just go ahead and get the permits and start building. There has to be a review, and that involves community engagement. So that might be an opportunity for bigger, you know, manufacturing <coughs> logistics zoned parcels. That might be a, a solution to kind of get more of the community involved throughout those processes if somebody was going to go ahead and build something new, right? Or 
do any major you know change to what's currently there um that may not necessarily mean to be rezoned but uh, that might be an, an opportunity and i think getting involved in something like the oac where um it's not something you pick up immediately <laughs> you have to um really read and i think i'll include some books and youtube videos for the folks who you know like to watch videos as well but as alicia said i was involved for years I actually went to grad school too. So it's not like I just, <laughs> I learned a lot of this stuff, um, you know, by just reading and listening and going to meetings. I sparked an interest um, trying to figure out what all of this meant and took the path of doing, um, you know, the education and a lot of book reading and, um, you know, seeing what other communities are doing and, and building that knowledge. So once the, you know, the UDL really took play, you know, uh, the process really took hold and, you know, we're going through these meetings at the OAC, I was more knowledgeable in being able to ask the right questions, make suggestions that could possibly make a difference, right? And I think I encourage all of you uh, to try to, to do that in some shape or form. Great, thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Um, Daisy, I just have one quick question. I know we need to move on. Um, Eric, can you stop sharing your screen for a minute? Yep. Thanks. As soon as I find where the button is there, it's <laughs> moved on me. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the things that Clean Air NC has worked on for years is to reduce diesel pollution because it's highly toxic. And um, we've talked and this might be something for you to think about. Uh, I just looked up Chicago and EJ, <laughs> and they do have a clean diesel construction initiative. So I just want to put that on your radar. Um, you know, one of my goals, I think maybe in San Francisco they do this. I know they've done it in some other cities, would be because the historic West End has a disproportionate uh, impact of in the community from the freeways. There's two interstates plus some other freeways um, that there could be some kind of um, zoning uh, where construction that will be happening, development in the historic West End would be required to use the um, cleanest equipment, the newest equipment, diesel equipment on the market. And we have worked with Novon Health and um, Atrium Health to develop a clean construction um, uh, specification. But I'm, I'm just curious, you know, that, that kind of zoning, you can say, okay, this is a special situation. Um, we don't want to add any more diesel emissions to this area. Is that something that might be considered in the future? or that the neighborhood could try to lobby for? Um, I, I won't say no, June. I would say there would have to be um, probably a lot of analysis around the benefits of that and the cost. Mm -hmm. um, because what I can hear a developer screaming now is that that would increase the cost of development. Therefore, we're passing that on to whatever if it's residential to the tenants and then that would just not be um, yeah. the ideal scenario i guess a cost of benefit analysis would definitely need to be um be conducted or performed and then to see if that is a primary pollutant in that area it might be others mm -hmm. um, um that that may that may be causing more pollution than the transportation emissions. So I won't say no. Um, okay. We just have to do a whole bunch of study and to see because I can just hear it now. Um, oh yeah, we've been here. <laughs> I can just hear it now. Um, so it would, it, we, I wouldn't put it off the table. But if the neighborhood yeah. wants to move with it, we definitely be open to those types of conversations. Yeah, Crescent Resources is doing the River District, and they've they've uh, agreed to do clean construction. So because, yeah. um, you know, there's the fleets are finally changing over since 2014, mm -hmm. they all mm -hmm. had filters and that kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. Most of the rental equipment is new. Um, yeah. So it's getting a little easier, but I, I wanted yeah. to throw it out there. That's a good just, idea. I, I think um, that, that's about. a good idea. And that really works for them um, at the River District. One, because mm-hmm. it's such large parcels under one ownership. So they yep. benefit more. Um, it might be a little bit more cost prohibitive for smaller infield developments in the historic West End. Just thinking of it from that, mm-hmm. kind of the scalability is a little different, but mm-hmm. definitely a good idea to explore in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ishmael uh, during these last 30 minutes, and we'll follow up with questions and, and closing comments. Hi, how are you guys doing? Um, my name is Ishmael Kayam. I uh, mentioned my firm, Queen City Community Law Firm. Um, uh, that's, I guess, my day job. I mean, primarily, um, I work with a lot of different community coalitions, um, primarily the Housing Justice Coalition, uh, Charlotte Housing Justice Coalition, and the uh, Charlotte Community Benefits Coalition um, to really advance um, issues that directly pertain to the conversation in reference to community benefits, um, but also just issues of equity, justice, and fairness, um, and really trying to work and open up a, a pathway for communities to have a voice in the development process um, here in Charlotte. So I myself, uh, I'm from West Charlotte, more the West Boulevard corridor. And that's, that's where I live is, you know, where I went to Harding for high school. And, you know, I'm, I'm back here, um, you know, uh, working on these issues because this is really important to me. And uh, Charlotte is where I grew up, is home. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll start out uh, just by saying that I think when, when we talk about uh, community benefits agreements, um, there has to be a very sort of just like truthful and kind of explicit acknowledgement of what we're really saying, right? And really what this comes down to is just a question of power. And by that, what I mean is, is that the, the decisions that are made in any city, in any municipality, at the state level, at the national level, are driven by interest groups um, that are able to exercise whatever varying degrees of power, right? Uh, power in reference to uh, elected officials, um, power in reference to other levers kind of within the system that ultimately result in the policy and what we see before us, right? Um, and specifically here, we're talking about zoning, regulation, growth, and all of economic growth and all these types of things. And so community benefits agreements are really uh, a tool whereby a, a community group or an organization of people can really leverage their power uh, by going by, you know, by going directly to the particular entity that they want to negotiate with or that they want to get a particular uh, item or a particular thing from, right? And it's basically an agreement that is that is kind of, you know, direct. Um, and oftentimes it can it can be between a community and a private entity. So in this particular case, we're talking about, um, you know, the companies that are basically crushing rocks and shipping them all over the city um, and potentially their concerns about pollution in the West End and so on and so forth. That's one aspect of it. The other part of kind of community benefits are is that we know that in the United States, oftentimes the government or the public sector is directly involved in working with the private sector, often in giving tax incentives and other things of that nature, right, to fund basically what are uh, private endeavors, privately run, managed and controlled endeavors, but may ultimately uh, have some kind of impact on the public, right? So um, this can be uh, like a, a large scale rezoning, um, you know, here in Charlotte, uh, this could be like a, you know, um, the, like, for instance, like the, the Eastland Mall project, or um, this could be um, the, the atrium, the atrium campus deal, right? Um, a lot of these projects receive large amounts of public funding. So when you think about community benefits agreements, I think the first thing you kind of have to realize is that what you're trying to do is leverage power as a community. And when we look at, you know, Charlotte, I mean, the history of Charlotte just simply is Charlotte is a very uh, finance, business, development oriented city. These entities from these particular groups have always had an outsized amount of influence and continue to have an outsized amount of influence um, in the planning and the decision making and what's being developed. Right. And so the, the fact is, is that if you if, if communities really want to, I would say, not only leverage that power for things the community actually needs. Right, but also I would I would take it a step further and say if communities just want particularly historically African American communities 
and working class communities want to be able to survive and exist in Charlotte in the future, in the short, in the medium term and long term, then there is really a need for communities to be to really be organized in a very uh, strategic way, where there is an understanding of the power structure, how decisions are made, and really where the sort of the points of leverage are for communities to be able to kind of extract these types of benefits. Because the truth is, is that the private sector does this all the time. And, and, and like no one bats an eye when developers do it, when landlords do it, when other people do it, they do it all the time, right? It's, it's just that because of the way things operate, frankly, in a capitalist society, they have access to channels of power and they don't have to necessarily like publicly present themselves or publicly criticize anyone. As community members, as people who, you know, people we live in neighborhoods, we may not have the money, our power is going to be organization and oftentimes leveraging our collective voices toward the, the things that we want. And that sometimes means, you know, sometimes going to the media or that sometimes means, you know, maybe shaming a particular person. And there's, there's really, um, it, it's, it's, it's nice when I think we are able to work with different entities to achieve goals that are mutually beneficial. And that is obviously like, that's the preferred way to do things, but sometimes that's not really possible and it does require some degree of like uh, being confrontational, right? And so uh, that's, you know, that's that. So I think oftentimes the, the practical thing that you're oftentimes trying to do with community benefits is really leverage the regulatory structure or, basically put pressure on elected officials who can sometimes either put pressure on uh, you know, entities within the private sector um, or even other entities within government to kind of come to the table and where you can basically try to, to negotiate for some specific things you want. And this can result in an actual contract being formed between a community organization or a set of community organizations and an entity in the private sector, or this can you know, just sometimes result in a particular policy being passed, right? And so, um, when we look at uh, what, we've, what we've been talking about up until now, the UDO, the, um, the Charlotte 2040 Comprehensive Plan, there's a, a myriad of these different things that have happened as a result of communities really organizing uh, and, and pushing um, for community benefits. I mean, the, the uh, Equitable Development Commission, the Nest Commission, um, actually the addition of more neighborhood people on the OAC, the Ordinance Advisory Committee, um, these were actually direct demands from the Community Benefits Coalition. Right, that, that, that resulted in, and actually that's the reason why I'm on the OAC now is because of not just myself, but, um, you know, Bobby Drake for Melissa Gass, Gass and other people. Um, so, I mean, what I'm, what I'm saying isn't theoretical, like it, it, it actually can work. So um, just for the sake of time, I think when we look at um, community benefits agreements, I think one of the things is obviously you want to know who your community stakeholders are, have a, have a sense of the, the folks in your coalition, and you want to build and create a unified coalition. It doesn't necessarily have to be structures of 501c3, it can be, but you just need to have a unified sort of group of people. And there needs to be an understanding of what the specific goals are you want. And in reference to a particular, uh, in reference to you know, what type of benefit you're pushing for. And then obviously there has to be a kind of strategic assessment of, you know, of the landscape, who those, you know, where you can apply the pressure and who can actually do what. Right. So um, to give that a little bit more context, I, from what I've seen, I kind of break it down into really three types of things. Um, oftentimes, a community benefit can be a particular project. It can be fixated on like a particular project, like I said, the Eastland Mall project or a particular site. And maybe you're wanting to engage with the developer or engage um, even with the city in reference to producing some sort of benefit or, or, ne or necessary item for the community. Um, another thing, another sort of place where we really can see benefits are we're talking about a, a process driven uh, uh, sort of um, item. So, for instance, the comprehensive plan, the unified development ordinance, the um, policy maps, the area planning, uh, the area planning process, all of these things are processes that are going to change the landscape uh, of what Charlotte really looks like. It's going to determine where investment goes, it's going to determine economic growth. And really, if communities are not engaged and not only engaged, but engaged strategically, with goals in mind and organized, then, you know, I think, you know, we're gonna lose out when it, in, in terms of the actual sort of future that Charlotte has. I don't think, you know, our communities won't benefit from it and, and, and we may ultimately not even really be a part of Charlotte as it exists in the future. So that's the other part is being constantly engaged in these processes. And, you know, um, that means 
you know, knocking on the door of, um, of city planning staff and, and um, city council and um, understanding what's going on, so on and so forth. And then the last part, obviously, is just is money, right, is, is trying to um, oftentimes look at budgetary items or seek, um, you know, investment from maybe different funds that are set aside. So you have the American Rescue Plan Act money, you have um, the mayor's racial equity fund, you have um, other sort of pockets of money that, that are desig designated towards a lot towards items that communities often cite in terms of uh, things that are needed, like affordable housing, um, you know, the development of like public space and things of that nature. Um, and so, for example, like you have the you have one deal, the, the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition was able to negotiate with a developer in reference to the PACES deal um, alongside the West, uh, the West Side Community Land Trust. Right? That's one example of a very of a, of a project oriented community benefit agreement that came as a result of these sort of community coalitions that have developed over time. The other items I mentioned in terms of um, the creation of the commissions, the people being put on the OAC, um, the reference to say the Community Benefits Coalition in the 2040 Comprehensive Plan, all of those things are a part of more of a process of planning um, uh, sort of like uh, approach to community benefits. Um, but with all that being said, I mean, I think the main thing to remember is that you know, this requires organization from the ground and this requires perspective and vision and strategy and kind of understanding where you can really kind of like uh, lever. And sometimes you can go directly to the entity the, that, that, is, that, you, that you want the particular item from. Either maybe you want them to provide something or stop doing something or a combination of both. And other times um, you may have to be really put pressure on, you know, electeds and on local government, um, particularly to really, um, to really uh, maybe open up space to, to, to for certain benefits to be provided uh, maybe by certain actors in the private sector, particularly actors that oftentimes are engaged in public-private partnerships. Um, so that's just a very uh, kind of basic overview of, of community benefits agreements um, with some examples that are, that are applicable here locally. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just leave the rest of the time for questions. And thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Do we have any questions? Yeah, this, this is Ron. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Ismail. Always engaging and, and enjoy your uh, insightfulness as well. Um, maybe if, if you could touch upon um, some of the difficulties may be encountered with, with trying to um, get community benefit agreements implemented or accepted here again through you know city government uh, and that type of thing uh, as far as you know again a lot of the feedback is saying that they're they are illegal um, but again I don't see anything illegal about having a conversation with someone that wants to develop something in, in within the community uh, to make it more acceptable to the um, residents there via jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe uh, if you could maybe expound on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, so I mean, I, I'm just kind of telling you my perspective. I mean, you know, uh, so I, I think that, so uh, one thing I think you're referring to uh, Mr. Ron is when the comprehensive plan started when this uh, last year, there was a, a very kind of lot, there was a, a chorus of, of folks kind of saying that community benefits agreements are illegal in North Carolina. And um, the, the CBC really had to sort of fight uh, to kind of push back on that idea, right? And that required some legal research and policy research and whatnot. So I think, I mean, broadly, <laughs> I mean, the answer really is just to continue pushing and to continue building and organizing. Um, and, and I mean, that, that's on a broad level, I think specifically in reference to what we're talking about, I think um, the first speaker, she mentioned basically that, you know, folks in the neighborhood were able to really, uh, to really get, already get some concessions uh, from this particular company that's engaging um, in, um, I guess, at the quarry. And so, I mean, I think that when you have a strong coalition that has staying power and, and is really representative and, and people are kind of on the same page and united, um, I think that really kind of that really kind of helps you to be able to leverage the political power. No matter what law is passed or not, nobody can stop you from from organizing and really building a coalition that can 
that can influence policymaking um, and a coalition that is formidable such that somebody, an entity from the private sector will at the very least want to have a conversation, you know, uh, with the community. So, I mean, that's, that's really the first thing. I mean, and the second thing, of course, is, um, you know, my position and my reading of it is that community benefits agreements are not legal and never have been. Um, I mean, I think the question is, is what the city can require. But um, I think, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, the position of HJC and from what I understand the CPC that if we're talking about public private partnerships where public dollars are involved, then the city can attach whatever conditions it wants, right, to a, to a particular development or project or what have you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's, you know, I think that's kind of a broad based answer, but I think that really is the answer when it comes down to it. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, Ron. I believe Alicia may have had a question. Yeah, I want to want to add to that, and and I thank you, Ishmael, for um for sharing information about community benefits, the agreement, and just in principle what the intent is. I, I think the perception is that there is some adversarial relationship or communication around the topic between the city, the city and the community. And I want, I want to, to be the first to say that's not true. Um, we, I, I don't speak for myself because what I want to be real clear about is that the concept of community benefits and the agreements were conceptualized in the plan before the draft went public because we had heard from the residents and and I personally had a, a personal um, calling to, to want that tool to be in the comprehensive plan when I started back in 2019. So the concept, the idea, and I think ultimately the goal we do share. Um, it's in the document, it, it has always been in the document. Now how that conversation proceeded might have been a little adversary and controversial amongst a group of folks who don't want it, and then the people who do want it. And, and I will say that we have always been on the side of supporting what the community wants and what's best for them, which is why it's even in the document in the first place. And so we have been working with Ishmael and the coalition and a group of developers, neighborhood representatives across the community to design what that looks like for Charlotte. Because what, what I think we quickly have realized that to get to that particular tool is gonna to be an incremental process. You can't go from zero to a hundred designing it for Charlotte. And so what we have been able to do in the past uh, four to six months is really look at what might work for us um, and that's everything from things that don't even involve the city at all, that the neighborhood could do themselves, what the developers could do themselves, and then everything in between and where we all meet in the middle. And so we have a documentation of what those tools might be. And that includes a community benefits agreement, but there are so many things that we can do to improve uh, community participation and development process outside of that formal legal thing that will take us a while to get because of North Carolina law, not Charlotte law, just North Carolina law. There are a lot of things that we as a city want to do that the state law prohibits us from doing. And so what we realized is that, all right, that can be the case today. What can we do today and work toward this ultimate goal of community benefits agreements and, and figure out what can happen um, today and in the future? And so, Ishmael, we completely support um, the neighborhood stance and where we want to go. We just want to make sure that, you know, we work together. Um, to get things done. And, and it's not as adversarial as it was during the comp plan, because I think we were all speaking from different terms and from different perspectives and, and really just not um, listening to each other. But I think we've been able to make some kind of headway in getting some common ground established, common terms established, 
um, and, and understanding here's a path or a couple of paths, I would say, that we need to take in the future. So, so I do want to just put that out there and, and, and thank you for your work and your leadership. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, ultimately, um, I mean, even when things were more adversarial at the end of the day, it resulted in these different groups of people and coalitions kind of coming together um, to, you know, ultimately hash something out. I think the point that I'm, that I really want to emphasize is not so much that um, we have to be at odds, but that the reality that a group of neighbors living in the West End that have been there for a long time have fundamentally different interests than a corporation or an entity that is, you know, purchasing property to generate profit, right? This maybe doesn't even have ties to Charlotte. I mean, that's just a fact, mm -hmm. right? And so that's, you know, it's not, it's not to say that there's no room for collaboration because at the end of the day, if we have an agreement or if we have a policy, it's going to require the different actors to be able to come together. But the fact is, is that the interest of all the parties are not the same. And all the parties historically, and I would say now, haven't had the same amount, the same ability to kind of exert um, their interest in what they would like, right? And so, and, and so part of what community benefits, the process does is allows for communities to organize and really build out that capacity to be able to actually just have a seat at the table and to be able to kind of, you know, um, really leverage and push for things that are, you know, going to be beneficial for people here in the city. I mean, you know, this, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I love Charlotte, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I have like, uh, I, I think I have a, a, some mixed feelings about things, but I mean, you know, this is a city where I grew up and I want to see everybody be able to benefit from the growth. So what I'm, what I've been doing and other people, what we're doing comes from that particular place. But um, there are just certain aspects of that. With that being said, though, I do want to say you, you all the planning staff, you've done a very a great job with the um, uh, Community Benefits Task Force and the Lookbook. And I think there's some some really great things in there. Um, and, um, and actually, some of the recommendations that, you know, the coalition has pushed, I think the city, the planning staff has really taken that on and is, you know, pushing that towards um, on toward council. So like I said, it's a process where different interest groups kind of come together. Sometimes there's conflict, but at the end of the day, you know, whatever happens is going to be a result of what everybody puts into the stew. Um, so, um, but yeah, no, no, you know, again, I mean, that's, this is about making Charlotte better for everybody at the end of the day. Hey, uh, Jeff, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Gerard and wasn't able to join the uh, discussion until later today, so I appreciate Eric and, and Jennifer um, stepping in for me. But I wanted to, as we were talking about the Community Benefits Agreement, I just wanted to raise up a huge win that Ishmael mentioned, but I don't think it should be glossed over when they that the win that was conquered at uh, on West Boulevard, where in, co in partnership with the West Side Land Trust, and Ishmael, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they negotiated it where the developer who's doing a senior living um, tax credit deal towards the end of the compliance year, which is typically about 15 years, 15 to 30 years, I believe, the end of the compliance period for those tax credits, the, the units, I believe, are going to be geared towards home ownership. And that has not been done in North Carolina at all. Um, and that, to me, is like a even though there's a lot of tension around a community benefits agreement, that tension presents progress in ways that go beyond the city of Charlotte, where now that deal is actually going to set a precedent um, for North Carolina, where you where you shift it from being a long term rental situation as we, you know, we have that on our corridor too, where, you know, places that have been rentals for so long, but we were able to, they've been able to shift that conversation to stay in power through home ownership. Um, and so I think that as you know, we look out into the UDO um, and figure out how the West Side can kind of present, show up with presence in order to, to have some stay in power so that Black folks can see 2040 um, in Charlotte in general. Um, I think the community benefits agreement in the spirit of, you know, in the spirit of introducing new mechanisms that may not be may not exist in the state but if it's a way that it could that creates an equitable future for everybody 
um, then we shouldn't shy away from that. Yeah, you're, you're right. It was it was the um, the West Side Community Land Trust and the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition, um, kind of working working in tandem, and there's just some great people, you know, strong black women involved, and it was yeah. I mean, it's it's everything you said it was. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and just for the record, like tax credits, um, and I, I know this isn't about affordable housing, this is a panel, a panel about affordable housing, but tax credit properties is essentially the biggest driver of affordable housing, um, and it essentially works as the banks own the housing, own the apartments for 15 years, and then they, they to get tax credits in return of their ownership, and then they sell it to a developer at the end of that compliance period. And so the revolutionary thing about this is now it doesn't just get sold to a developer at the end of the compliance period. It's sold back to the people in the form of home ownership. Um, and so, uh, so I'm glad Ishmael, I'm glad he, he referenced it, but I don't think we should gloss over it. I, I did want to raise a question, though, um, in the spirit of kind of forward progress around the place map that I think Alicia mentioned earlier, and I think Eric mentioned it earlier, too, is another um, opportunity, engagement opportunity. Um, going back to, I think June mentioned this idea of, of clean construction sites. Just to throw this out there, would it be ideal for us to look at industri heavy industrial places like Hoskins Road um, or the Marietta Quarry, where we have certain places that have um, like a, a heavy industrial, identified as heavy industrial as a place type in order and, and require that we have clean construction with at those place map types, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Where it's not, you know, I get, Alicia, I get what you're saying because the develop, a residential developer having to take the burden on of a clean construction site that will increase the prices for sure. But if, if there was a place that like the like the rock quarry or another industrial site that's going to, you know, look at as their site said, a place that's already plagued environmentally, can we require that to be a clean construction site? Well, it just depends on um you would have to look at the land use, um, the policy, I mean the place type and see what pollutants are associated with that place type. And if that clean air uh, or clean construction site is the solution to address that particular pollutant. So, and then what are the commonalities across that place type in throughout the entire city? So you have to be equitable in how you apply it. And from that regard, if we're gonna try something new in my opinion, I'm not ruling it out, but that's what my initial thinking is. If we're going to say, all right, let's look at quarries across the city, um, that particular place type that's assigned to that quarry, what pollutants are emitted or produced by that, and then what's what are what does that clean construction does that really address the pollutant that's assigned mm -hmm. to that particular use? So I guess we would need to know more about what 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 pollutants are produced by certain uses and then what's the place type associated with that because it may not be industrial um, or, or it may be something else I'm not sure um, but we can look at it during the um, area planning process to see as a start yeah um, drug thanks for bringing that up uh, I just put a link in the map to you know we're looking at it Charlotte our organization works across the state and we're looking at health inequities across the state and how the state is permitting multiple, multiple, multiple pollutants. And so you end up with all these cumulative impacts. Right. But the state of Washington, of course, they've had state legislation, um, but they have looked at the health outcomes across their state and certain every state agency before they can do anything in these health equity zones has mm -hmm. to go through a process. And so, I mean, I think for us, it's it's also about health. You know, y yes, I mean, any, any level, it's very difficult. And I understand what you're saying, Alicia, about it does that pollutant impact. And, you know, there are some pollutants and that's construction equipment that no level is safe. 
Um, and so it's really hard when you want the data, but mm -hmm. it's not exactly where you want it. Um, so I just, I really want the city to be open to looking uh, at just uh, different ways of um, figuring out which communities have been impacted over the years disproportionately by environmental um, factors. Um, but I, I think this is a great conversation and, you know, we're looking into it statewide. We would be happy to work with the city on looking at it locally. I, I would say city and county and, and probably possibly the MPOs, because I think when we talk about um, environmental measures, a lot of our data is regional, right? Because it, it, it all goes back into our air quality conformity plan, master plan that we have for the region that each city or, um, and, and county kind of supports. And so uh, we would definitely have to think beyond kind of city of Charlotte impacts when we look at it, because mm -hmm. a lot of our data points and how we govern ourselves is from a regional perspective too. Yeah, good point. Yep, yeah, we're over. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll try anything. <laughs> we'll try anything, <laughs> especially if it's going to help. And, um, and Miss Maddie uh, just posted an important um, comment related to our efforts as well, the importance of citizen scientists and data-driven results for advocacy. So continuing to monitor and continuing to build up that data. Um, which uh, segues me into, I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. We're a little bit over 7.30. So um, uh, before we, we wrapped up, I just wanted to uh, make a few announcements. Um, actually, Ron, did you wanna make an announcement about a potential uh, mon community monitoring um, event? Uh, yes, I think we're gonna have, uh probably a tentative date. Um, one of our uh, projects initiatives is to um, increase uh, our quality monitors that we have in, in our communities. And we would like to, to maybe take a look at a couple of sites that are within the historic West End and, and do some air quality monitoring specifically at, at those uh, sites. Uh, one specifically, um, uh, again, we're, we're talking about uh, Mont Marriott or uh, Rock Quarry. Uh, there's a lot of ingress, egress of, of, of trucks and so forth coming out of, out of that facility and uh, rocks th thrown out and so forth, a lot of the, uh, the dust. So uh, at this point, I would say, uh, I don't know that I mentioned this to, to Daisha, but um, probably if we're looking... Uh, is August the 6th, 6th a good day, Daisha, or no? But it would have to. Yeah, I would say that's a good date on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might have to take that back because they may not, I don't think the facility does a lot of work on that on that day. So uh, I, we may have to get back to you on, on a date. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I get in the morning. So, and that's usually the best time. Uh, to catch the, the trucks entering and, and exiting the, the facilities just to, to capture that data uh, uh, on over a period of time. So um, at this point, we'll stick with uh, August the 6th and we'll probably, we'll send something out with a, a specific time. Again, it's going to have to be earlier uh, because, uh, again, uh, due to the heat as well. So, but uh, that's a, a tentative uh, date for doing that as well. So. Ms. Byer, Ms. Byers Bailey, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, and I'm sorry, I was trying, I was on my phone and I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand and I kicked <laughs> myself out instead and then I came back and now I've got two of me on here. But um, I was listening to the discussion about the, uh, the apartments that had a 15 year tax credit. And after that, the neighborhood was going to try to own it or it was gonna become owners, owner occupied. And I'm thinking about the LaSalle at Lincoln Heights senior apartments. And I think they're in that type of a situation. 
And I was wondering, is it too late for us to try to inter interject ourselves into that and become some kind of a owner occupied or uh, situation? Um, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's, um, I want to say no, but it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say without having more details in terms of, you know, the specifics around, um, you know, the owner, what the, what the folks are interested in. Have, have you talked to other people kind of within the facility about that and what that might look like? No, um, that's, that facility is fairly old. It was originally built by the, um, um, Northwest Car, the CDC, I think, and uh, they went defunct, and it went, it went to some corporate entity, mm -hmm. and the problem has come up because the uh, the facility is not being managed up to the standard that we would like to see it, and the residents have been complaining, and it's hard for them to get uh, any traction, and. It's been so. Oh, it's been there so long that I was wondering if that fifteen-year period hasn't isn't uh, coming to a close, and if that would be a good time for us to try to grab it, basically. Hey, uh, yeah, this this buys belly. This is Gerard. Uh, I think that is possible. It's actually owned by a group called the Housing Partnership Network. Um, so it's a, it's a non-profit, quasi-non-profit, mission-oriented. Um, it's not locally owned, unfortunately. So I'm sure they would they would engage in the conversation about, you know, how to how to make it locally owned or how to make it a little more equitable. Um, so I think that's a great idea. I'm glad you kind of pointed it out. I'd like to follow up with you about it. Okay, I've been trying to. Uh, we were we were working with them. Uh, having a ve had a very good re working relationship with what the prior manager, and then they've gone through a set of managers, um, and I don't know that I if they have a new manager now, she that person must be with have been appointed within the last month mm -hmm. because they uh, the residents were complaining to me because. They are essentially part of our neighborhood association. Mm. And Mr. Whit Mr. Whitfield's over there too. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's yeah. uh. We should talk about that. I think Jen is on this. Is Jen still here too? I'm still here. Yeah. Yes, Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Hello, yes, Miss family. We could talk. We could follow with you about that and. And I think Ishmael and the West Side Land Trust might have found a set of precedent too that we can lean on them to figure out the best way forward. But I think that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. I, I'd like. I, I'm glad. I'm glad I heard about it, and I'm glad that uh, I'm hopeful that we can come to some resolution that is more beneficial because most of the residents in there are former resident homeowners in Lincoln Heights, and that was the whole purpose of the facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ron, oh, sorry. Thank you, Ms. Byers-Bailey. Is, is this you also on the phone or is that a separate person with the question? No, that's, that was me trying to get back in on my phone and then it wasn't working. So I decided to just go to my laptop. Okay. <laughs> and I know I don't know how to get rid of the one down there. So at least it's not, <laughs> it's not giving us any feedback, so. I see uh, Ishmael is, has dropped his uh, contact information in the chat, and we will also send out contact information um, of speakers if, if speakers are okay with that in our follow-up email. Um, and I also wanted to make everyone aware, and including our, our speakers today, that we will be hosting a, a Historic West End Green District stakeholder meeting. Um, August 16th from 6 to 7. Uh, this will be our first uh, of many quarterly meetings. Um, and then, yeah, and then we will also set your calendar for August 6th, do a community monitoring event. And then again, I wanted to remind everyone that I will be dropping off um, stipends and resource packets and installing monitors um, on August 2nd. 
uh, along with Ron and, and a couple of coworkers of mine. So if you are free uh, to install a monitor that day and you indicated on the survey that you wanted to monitor, uh, we can go ahead and get that set up for you that day. But again, we're flexible. So if another day works better, just let me know. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone for their time. Uh, thank you for all the wonderful and relevant information from our speakers. Um, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, how this advances. I really appreciate everyone's time.